some good Afro engineering there, brother. I'll put this back in the van, Mark. You guys are ready for? Yeah. Hey, where'd you go, Gatlin? Candy quick. Hi, sweetie. Is that insane or is it working? Working perfect. Find out in a minute. Now, all you conspiracy guys know this rule already, don't you? How many know this rule? I do. I, I do. do. I do. <laughs> all right. Uh, who else? Do you know this rule? I don't believe so. Okay. Who does? Who said they did? One's a man and one's a person. Yeah. And which one are you? How you do? Okay. Uh, what does this mean? That's uh, the bottom name is your all capital. That's a, the new the new uh, corporation for the government. The one right above it is the old corporation. The one right above has your name. Oh, okay. Now, what does Sean think it means? I think one of them's a man, and one of them's a man who has a, a mask yeah, on and has. Yeah. yeah, you can't ask me, dude. Yeah, I've watched you four hundred thousand hours. <laughs> what do you think this one means? Corporation of. Okay. This is the way in Roman law. This was considered the slave, yeah. property of somebody or something. It's a slave. It's a title. It's a corporation. It's something that's created, something that's owned, something that's under control. This means that you're a member of a family, which means that you are a, a citizen. Mm -hmm. You're a citizen. A citizen literally means a member of a family in Roman law. Roman citizen, you were a member of their family. You couldn't wait to get the title of Roman citizen. And then the other one means that you think you're freaking God. That's what it means. There is no limits on you. There is no restrictions on you whatsoever. You are the creator. Now, if you want to talk like this down to, say, the USA, that's fine. Because it's going to be very hard for them to challenge that you ain't their creator. But the way I always try to address myself throughout planet Earth is, I believe I'm a member of a family, I believe I'm a citizen. I have duties and obligations, responsibilities to those children, mom, aunts, uncles. I don't believe I'm sovereign. You're not sovereign, but you have sovereign rights. Okay, no rights. Only over that which I create. So let's 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 take care of that. Okay, now is that right or wrong? I don't know if I spell I E E I. That's probably pretty damn close. <laughs> Everybody knows what sovereign is, right? Sovereign means God. Okay, sovereign means it means that you can defy law. And law does not apply to you. Okay. Now I can say law doesn't apply to me, but you better believe law applies to me. You better believe the customs, practices, policies, and beliefs of my people. you damn right, better comply to me, because they will hang me. <laughs> but the law does not apply. That's fine. Some sort of legal societal order, law, that's fine. If I wish to accept it, fine. If I don't, I don't. But sovereign means to defy law, or law does not apply. To say I'm sovereign means that I can walk, hit, run right at that wall and go to my truck, and I go go through an open passageway. I do this to poor, like poor people who call me on the, all the time on the phone, like Gus, my sister, anybody. He says, uh, I'm walking into the courthouse. I said, oh, you're sovereign today, huh? You're going to walk into the courthouse, huh? How about we look for an open passage, make sure it's clear, and we pass through. Oh, I'm going to walk into school today. Oh, really? I'm parking in, uh, oh, I'm, I'm in the parking lot. Oh, really? What part? Are you the striped lines or are you the black top? You're in the parking lot, huh? That, that's special. You're like, no, I'm, I'm on top of it. Okay, okay, I thought you said you were, you're just pulling into, you're in the parking lot now. Oh, really? That must be quite painful. But this is what I try to say to people. That's why you try to, when, when I talk in court, or I tell anybody to talk, I try to say no more than 10 to 20 words. Because somebody like me is going to be sitting in front of you and say, well, did you come into court today? Yeah, I, I walked into court today. Oh, that's special. And I have to be able to tell right up quickly, the judge will be able to tell, did you, you know, did you just park? Are you in the parking lot? Yeah, I'm in the parking lot. Oh, really? Huh. It's cute. You know, so that way he can feel you out real quick. You know, if you know actually the meaning of these words. Like, oh, yeah. Are you in the parking lot? Yeah, I'm in the parking lot. Oh, really? Okay. No, you, trust me, you're not in the parking lot.
So like I say to people, one of the easiest things they always mess up with is they say in the United States District Court for Middle Alabama. They say in. And some poor lady was on the phone with me last night for about an hour. I tolerated it for a while because I was out doing the horses and stuff, so I was fine. I was walking out in the field and had the phone like this, just talking away. But it's funny, she was trying to get her children back from her husband, and I don't get involved in that nonsense. There's a reason why the kids are where they are, and it's way above my pay grade to care. But when the government takes the children away, that's different. So when it's husband and wife, I can get involved. I, you know, the judges and family members, I'm sure everybody else already sorted it out the best they could. And who might have come in as an interloper, you know, and try to guess why she lost the kids. So, uh, yeah, let me give an example of that one real quick. I used to do a show on Thursday nights when I first started, just for women to get their children back from the government. That's it. I didn't do it. I didn't listen to any credit card nonsense, IRS problems. I didn't care about it. I just did a Thursday show to talk to women to get their kids back from the government. That's all. So some lady uh, uh, calls me up uh, in May. And she donated to me $100 in April when she heard that I got Jonathan and Jesse's kids back in Canada. So she calls me up in May. She doesn't remind me that she gave me a $100 donation for telling me thank you for helping that Canadian couple. She calls me up on my Thursday show for women. And she said she had her two-year-old and four-year-old girl taken away, and now they're 14 and 16, and um, she hasn't been allowed to see them. And Daddy's part of the Illuminati. Daddy was a Jesuit priest, always learning to be one. Then he left, and he married me, had kids. The, the judges up here in Canada are on slave tra sex trafficking rings. It's pretty, pretty wild, the stuff she was coming up with. And she said, I'll send you a newspaper clip, and I'll send you said, yeah, man, 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 man. His husband and wife, I, I don't get along. She says, oh, no, they wouldn't even let me have trial. I said, yeah, yeah, okay, ma'am. I said, can you um, send me the case file, what, you got look, what we're looking at? So she said, yeah, sure. And so she sent me the case file, and I guess since she figured it was about that thick, I wasn't going to bother reading it. Well, I read it. And then uh, she called him next week on the show, and she says, well, what are you going to do? I said, at this time, I don't feel comfortable helping you at this time. I'm going to, that's my last Thursday show that I ever did. So if you ever look on my website, and you ever look on TalkShoe website, TalkShoe.com website, and it's 127469, it's the last Thursday show I ever did. And every other show after that was Saturday or whatever, but that was the last Thursday show I ever did. Because I said to the lady, I don't feel comfortable this time helping you. And all the other women started jumping me, saying, oh, you know, why won't you help her? I said, because I believe that children should be with the father, and they're doing just fine, and I don't believe that I should get involved. He said, well, wait a second, they're girls, and girls can to learn certain things from their moms, you said. I said, that's right. If you go back and go old basic law, common law, biblical law, the girls were supposed to be with their mom until they were 14. And the boys were allowed to be discharged their father at the age of five, when they no longer had to be fed. I said, but no, I said, these girls are fine right where they are. And then uh, all the women started jumping on me, saying, you're just like every other man, male chauvinist pig, and you know, you don't care about women. And it's like, yeah, oink, oink. You call me whatever the hell you want. Ed Helm and them attacks have absolutely nothing to do with me, because I'm from New York, and I couldn't care less what you think of me, because I could put myself down a million times harder than you ever could dream of. So I said, you're just wasting your time trying to humiliate me, because I don't care. I said, uh, you wouldn't feel this way, that I'm not... Doing it in his children's best interest? No. Okay, then F you's all, and uh, I'm done. And I stopped doing the show. That was in May. So I went over to England. And when I came back, I was exhausted. I mean, I spent five weeks over there. It was a hell of a trip. Oh, it was with Bali? Oh, yeah, with the, with the Punjabis and, yeah. and just doing meetings like this, but big crowds. And I was exhausted. And, uh, yeah, I was, uh, everybody said, how do you like England? What do you see? I said, I looked at the side of the rugby cement plant, the biggest cement plant in the United Kingdom. So that's what I looked out my window for five weeks and saw the rugby cement plant. No, it wasn't next to Palm and Buckingham Palace. No, I looked at the rugby cement plant. We'd get up at 7.30 in the morning and start running around the country talking to people. So no, I didn't have tea with the Queen. No, that didn't happen. So that was in May. I got back in uh, Christmas Eve. January, I'm listening to a show 
and this lady gets on the show, and she starts going on somebody else's show saying, uh, oh, I tried to get Cole to help me, da da da, and uh, he takes my money, and he won't call me up, and da 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 da, and I haven't had trial, haven't had court, da 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 da, Jesuit priest, all this nonsense. Somebody calls me up and says, hey, uh, some lady's bashing you on some show. I said, I don't care, I'm exhausted, I couldn't care less. And they said, uh, so what show? So I called the show and I said, hey, you know, uh, during the week I called up the show and I said, hey, book me on, book me on next week. So I said, okay, and get that lady on. I said, okay. So I called up the, uh, so when I called up, I didn't do it until the day of the show. I sent the, the, the hostess of the show, page 17, of the case file. I said, read it. And they said it was written by five women. Bro, it was a nurse. Well, it was two nurses, the emergency room nurses. It was the clergy lady that was a woman, clergy member of the, and it was the hospital's attorney, and it was the chief of staff, the head of the hospital. Five women wrote an affidavit to the judge. You better remove these children from this woman immediately because she's raping them, and she's trying to pin it on daddy. And I had that lady hostess of the show read it out loud. What five women affidavits read? And she's like, oh my God, this woman's an animal. Maybe, maybe. I said, but I bet yeah, I could uh, help the woman. I said, but uh, what she's telling you folks, there's a reason why I don't help certain people. And there's a reason why I say I can't. At this time, I don't feel comfortable. She said, she said uh, I said, and ma'am, you said you gave me money. When did you give me money? She said, April. And was that to help you get your children back? She's like, well, no, that's saying thank you for Jonathan and Jesse. Right. Did you tell me at any time you ever gave me any money? No. I said, how would I know that? I said, so let me put it this way, ma'am. I said, uh, I'm willing to help you now. Because now, the children are 14 and 16 years old. So there was a, the lady actually had a psychiatrist on her show that so she was interviewing. I said, let's ask the psychiatrist what he would recommend you do before I tell you what to do. And he was like, you know, trying to come up with like, well, that's horrendous what she did. That's horrible. That's evil. That's da 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 mm -hmm. I said, okay, that's great. Lovely. I said, why don't you go to the court and say at one time you had a belief. Or you believe. Which means you have a conviction. And if you believe Jesus is going to rise from the dead in three days, you believe it that you have a conviction. So, we're going to explain to the court and we're going to explain to the counselors. At one time you believed that a two-year-old, four-year-old girl was in danger by being next to a man because you watched too much Oprah Winfrey, you watched too much uh, Lifetime movies, you watched too much Geraldo, you watched too much nonsense where grandpas are taking pornos of the kids and grandpas are going to jail over this, and even grandpas are evil, you know, you know, they look like Santa Claus, every man is horrible. Every man is going to live to just have sex. Every five seconds of his brain is just working on having sex, and when they run out of having sex with women between the ages of 16 and 16, they start going after the children. Because you guys are getting in such a frenzy for watching so much Oprah and Lifetime movies, you, you guys are starting to lose it. So you're going to say to the court, you're going to say, I want to get therapy, I want to try to get this belief out of my system that all men aren't evil, and then I would like to have visitations with my children. But she was saying, I said uh, to the hostess, I said, uh, did she tell you she didn't go to trial yet? Yeah. Well, she spent twenty thousand dollars on an appeal six so years ago. I said it's in the case file. I said so. This one was still whatever off the deep end, which is fine. That she, but I, if now at fourteen and sixteen, I feel comfortable with helping her because if she tries to do anything to a fourteen or sixteen years old child now. They're probably about the same height as Mama, same weight, same strength, same everything. Mama tries any stunt, these 14, 16-year-old kids will kick her teeth out. I'm sure they know the difference between right and wrong now. Now, if you were two years old and four years old, obviously I wouldn't be giving this lady this advice, how to how to win visitations with the children, because she'd still be up to a dastardly deeds, because she could actually physically and mentally control a two-year-old and a four-year-old. Good luck with trying to do a 14, 16-year-old teenage girl. Good luck. So the psychiatrist guy said to me, he says, you know what? He did graduate studies at uh, Brigham Young, and he said he uh, went, did his intern and uh, got his doctorate over in Miami in, uh, in Ohio. And he says he's seen doctors and psychiatrists for years, he says, that he studied under. And uh, he said, I've never seen anybody just come right to the heart of the matter, solve it in two seconds, and move on. That's because I'm a contractor. I get paid when the job is done. 
you guys do billable hours like attorneys. You guys have two or three clients for a year and you milk it for everything you can. I said, I'm a contractor. I said, I'm like Walmart, you know, high volume, low rates. Just boom, 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 knock it out, get it done. What do you got? Oh, you want to come and paint my fence or whatever you did? You put a boiler in. Oh, I got to explain. I boiler you put it. <laughs> Hey, it's in right. Don't be looking at me like that. Okay. <coughs> when I shut off my water heater, my bill went from two hundred fifty dollars a month to twenty five dollars a month. You talking about the big one? No, no, no. Well, yeah, it's using more water. I've been taking showers in my mom's house for like two months. Now. <laughs> 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 I'm just trying to be nice, man. <laughs> oh, that was well. What a great guy I am. Huh? Nice presents for me. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. That's what I did. I shut the. I said to my mom, I, so I saw this month's bill. It was like seventy bucks. We gave him a forty-gallon heater. Yeah, it's six. the water heater. It's the freaking water heater. Friends like that who needs enemies. But anyway, it's an office trail. It went from two fifty to down to where it's supposed to be. Three months. I couldn't figure out why the That's bill so was funny stuff, it? But anyway, but this is a belief and a conviction, and everybody is unique and everybody is different. Obviously, I'm not going to tell this lady how to get back a two-year-old, four-year-old. So I try to explain to people this knowledge or this information I'm giving out. It's everybody's unique and everybody's different. Everybody's situation is, and it's funny. I know people at the Supreme Court level, at least their clerks, are listening to my stuff. Every case is the same, every case is unique. I heard somebody actually say that on Fox News, and this is what I've been saying for years. Every case is the same, yet every case is unique. Every case is the same because you have to have two parties in controversy. And every case is unique because the parties are always different. You, know, you might be dealing with a two-year-old girl or a 22-year-old girl. One might be a minor, one might be an adult. This, it's, it, every case is the same, and every, yet every case is unique. So, uh, like I said, back to the um, to capitalization rule. Make it very simple when it comes to this kind of stuff as well, when it comes to cases. When you see me do something like I, man, call, lens. What I did is I said, I believe I have a creator. He created man, the man known as call lens. So if I just said I, say versus USA, that's like me saying God versus the United States of America, the Creator versus that which I created. I'm sobbing over anything I create. See this piece of paper? I'm sobbing over it. Haha, <laughs> sorry, paper, you just died. <laughs> what are you going to do? Sue me? Well, you got rights? No, you ain't got rights. You ain't got nothing. You know what you got? You got about three more seconds to lift off planet Earth and then you're going to be animized because I'm going to light you up and put you into the atmosphere. I could create that which I destroy. I'm sovereign. That's fine. I, this has no rights. What you notice a lot of times, I love watching people's lawsuits. It's a lot of fun. Watching people's lawsuits. Oh, you know what's even more fun? Watching criminal complaints. You'll see. States of America. Oh, really? That, that's just lovely. I, I like that. So then one of the first things I would do is I'd either say that I believe you have an error in the parties, the titling of the parties. You may refer to me as Carl Lance. If I'm, if I'm, if a man is accusing me of doing something wrong, you may call me Carl Lance. Your creator. If you believe that you govern me, because I do not believe you do govern me. They made the sign that the United States of America was anti-corporation. They're saying, for some reason, they believe 
that they're superior to men because if they wrote their name United States, they believe they're supreme, then they created themselves. If it's an all lower case, you think you just you're here because you're God, you're here. So when you see people writing an all lower case, I see that it's like, oh, you don't believe you have any duty obligation to your fellow man, you believe you just spontaneity appeared within the universe, you've been here for all times because you're the sovereign being, you're God. Oh, isn't that just lovely? When I see people writing like that, I say, what a crackpot. I'm not dealing with this guy. I'm only going to deal with somebody who at least writes like that. He believes he has duties and obligations to his fellow man. He's a member of us family. He's a member of, you know. And is that what they're saying by spelling the United States of America that way? Oh, yeah. It's lovely watching them spelling it this way and then putting me in all uppercase. It's, right. it's a lot of fun. So I think, uh, uh, what are you looking for? Oh, you must be looking for that which you created. Oh, you're looking for, possibly, could be the birth certificate that you're looking for? Or possibly you're looking for some social security card? What exactly did the United States of America create that is titled Call Lance? Because you certainly didn't create me, did you? You know, so that's always a lot of fun when you know, we see them spelt in names like that. Let me finish this one. I didn't notice I was up there. This is how Jonathan and Jesse got that shown back basically instantly. It's because I say to people, do you know the difference between the word in and at? Do you guys ever heard me say the difference between in and at? Ever hear me explain it? Okay. Um, you see that big tree over there? Uh, let's go, or even better, you see that huge rock next to it? Let's go meet in that rock. Well, how about we go meet at the rock? Which one would you prefer today to do? At. Why not meet in the rock? Okay, get in. <laughs> oh, you're going to get in. But you ain't going to get out. I had to wait this. Until the rock lets you out, you ain't out of it. You go in the district court, and there's a man in a black robe sitting there. You go in that court. You ain't getting out of the court until that man in the black robe tells you you're going to leave. You become an element of that rock. You become an element of that court. You're a party to it. You ain't going nowhere. So I'm not going to be in any damn court unless it's my court. I'll meet you at the court, but I'm certainly not going in the court. That'd be suicide. Because I always tell people, man, just to look at the Alice in Wonderland, the guy who wrote that thing, the Queen of Hearts. No matter how proficient Alice was at croquet, the Queen kept changing the rules of the court. No matter how skillful she was, no matter how damn good she was, she was the best croquet planet on, player on planet Earth. Oh, none. She was the best legal mind, the best lawyer, the best attorney. You walk into their court, they're going to change the rules on you. I don't give a damn what you think it is. Well, well, no, I win because, no, 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 no. We're just going to look back three steps and we're going to do it. Wait a second, that's, that's against the rules. Whose rules? Whose court do you think you win? You think you win your rule? Whose court do you think you're at? So this is why Jonathan and Jesse were able to get their kids back so fast. And thank God the court clerk did this. any arsenal court at Queen's Bench, New Brunswick. So, uh, no, yeah, that's four. Four means a benefit of means within. So when you're in the United States District Court, United States District Court, for Middle Alabama, that means for the benefit of Middle Alabama. So, uh, that's where the four is up here. You, middle Alabama, United States District Court put a United States District Court in the middle of Alabama for the benefit of the people in Alabama. If it was of, like the United States of America, the United States is for the benefit, is part of the Americas. So it's of means within and for means a benefit. If we're here to benefit you, I'm here for you. For that you receive the benefit. So it's in the Arsenal Court at Queen's Bench for New Brunswick. The very first thing the court clerk did is she did this. Oh, she did, we put at, she did this, and she wrote the word in. There's no doubt about it that it, that actually had a, a difference in the meaning. Because they said, no, you could be in the court, but you can't be at the court. So, oh, sorry about that. In, I mean, she was in the Arsenal Court at Queen's Bench. Sorry about that. She's, she crossed this out. She says, no, you're in Queen's Bench. 
is a no, we're at the Queen's Bench. We're not going to go up under the rules of Queen's Bench. We're going to be, we're going to be, be up at the Queen's Bench. We're not going to be in Queen's Bench because then we got to abide by the rules of Queen's Bench. Now I say to people, like I said, this poor lady yesterday, in and that. This lady was told yesterday, she called me up and she said, the judge um, put out an email to all the courts in North Dakota that she cannot no longer file anything in their courts, in their district courts. And I tried to explain this lady, it's like, if you keep trying to bring a basketball in a tennis court, they're going to restrict you. They're going to tell you you can't come into our tennis court anymore because you're bringing a basketball into a tennis court. You got to stop. That's not the rules. That's not how we play the game. I said to her, if you want to go in North Dakota in the district court in North Dakota, if they don't let you put in your own paperwork, you have to fill out a form and fill out a form. She said, but I don't want to fill out a form in district court. Well, then put it at the district court. But don't be in the district court. I said, file it at the district court. It was the court clerk at the district court. Then she has to file it. But I said, what's happening to you, ma'am, is they're asking is they're saying to you a very simple question. When she first said to me, she said that she went to bring the paperwork to the district court lady. And she said, the district court lady said, I'm going to bring it to the judge and see what he says. I said, the first thing you should have said to her to make her understand that you understand this gibberish nonsense is like the judge. You mean you're going to talk to a man who's acting as a judge, or are you going to talk to a judge? So once they realize that you understand the difference, it's like, ma'am, you're, you're a woman acting as a court clerk, right? Yeah. Are you going to go talk to a man who's acting as a judge and ask if another man or another woman could, you know, use this public courthouse and access this public courthouse? You're not trying to deny I, your fellow woman, your fellow man, access to a public building, are you? Little simple things like that. That would have been a big difference between her saying, well, I'm going to ask the judge. And she's like, no, you don't need to ask the judge. To me, it's like, what, you going to talk to my dogs? You know, the guys, who, the, those who just, the, the hell, the judges who just determine whether the you know, this is, you know, acceptable beef jerky or not? What's a judge? So, like I said, if you could do something just that simple, it's like, what's a judge? What judge? What are you talking about? The judge? Judge what? You mean a man who's going to act as a judge? Is, is that where we're going with this? So like I said, this in and the at stuff is a, a lot of fun because the judge will say, you're in my court. Hmm. And I said, if the judge did that to me, uh, there was a man who went up there with me, a Portuguese man. A lot of fun. We um, had a, um, I filed a claim against um, social service people and, you know, and uh, the man who was acting as governor. And uh, when I filed it, I was like, at you know, lens court, you know, uh, oh, in the lens court, at circuit court. And uh, I forgot, it was like the 24th circuit, something like that. Virginia. It was in lens court, at the circuit court. So when I got up there for like a preliminary hearing to see if everything was, you know, all the paperwork was submitted properly or whatever to get ready for a trial. The judge tried to say to me, the first thing when he did, he says, okay, this is the matter between plaintiff, and I'll call Lance, and uh, I don't remember the governor's name. Uh, it's Terry something. I know it's a woman's name like that. McAlfie. That's it. So McDuff, woman. McAlfie or whatever. Yeah, something like that. Mc something. Right. McNuggets, right. Donald. Right. But his first name is Terry because it could be a woman's name. So he said, "This is a you know, this is a complaint against um, Terry McDuffie by plaintiff called Lance." And I said, "You must have the wrong case before you because I'm a claimant. And a claimant literally means a man who is seeking recovery of his property." And the judge says, "Well, you're a plaintiff." I said, "Literally, plaintiff with one F in French is a nagging old woman." who does nothing but complain all day. She has nothing to back up her complaints, but she just complains all day. I am not a plaintiff. I am not filing a complaint. He says, I have a, claim, a complaint before me. I said, no, you have a claim before you. File by a claimant. 
And that's what you have before you, sir. He says, no. He says, this is my court. I said, am I, whose court am I in? He says, I'm, you're, I mean, I said, I did not file in, in, in Victor's court. I said, your name is Victor Ludwig, right? I'm not in Victor's court. I am in the Lens court at the circuit court. I said, and what are you doing with my paperwork anyway? Why are you reviewing it anyway? Because I asked for a, a trial by jury. Why are you looking at my paperwork anyway? This is for the eyes of the jury only. This was to remain sealed. I don't require any act, a, a assistance from the court, you know, to, to, to assist me in moving my case before a trial by jury. I do not require anything from you at this time. So it's just funny that the um, judge says to me, he says, well, you're in my court. I said, well, then obviously, you know, I filed and I paid the fee to be here. And I said, well, I filed the fee to be here today. And, uh, you know, I'm going to, you know, move my case before a trial by jury. So he says, not in my court. I said, absolutely not. I said, I want you to have absolutely nothing to do with this. I said, I said, if you noticed, I said, I require a court of record. And I said, then you do know what a court of record is. And he says, this is a court of record. This is a circuit court. This is a court of record. I said, right. I said, so. I said, you know, a court of record only moves under the common law. You know it only moves under the common law, a court of record. I said, you know that it is to be a trial by jury. I said, you know any of, of court officer who works here, It's just to bear witness of the trial. I said, you'd have no actual, I said, uh, I said, you could sit off somewhere to the left or the right of us. I said, but I'm going to require a jury to be before I and the defendant so we could present the case to the jury. I said, I don't require any assistance other than for you to bear witness of what the jury renders that day. He said, well, that's not going to happen. I said, oh, really? I said, um, I said, where do you believe you derived that authority to tell a man how he can or cannot access a public building? And what's good is, um, I said to him, I said, sir, I said, do you not remember me from seven years ago when I stood in your court and I explained the difference between, to you, the difference between legal and lawful? I said, do you not remember the difference between legal and lawful? I said, what you're trying to do is attempt to get me to go into a legal procedure when I wish to move on to a lawful procedure. I said, I do not wish to be in a legal procedure at this time. I said, I don't see the benefit. So I went on to explain to him, uh, uh, you know, I don't wish, you know, for any assistance of the court. You know, I said, when I'm ready to move my case forward, I'll let the court clerk aware of the day that I wish to summons the wrongdoers, the defendants, before this court, and I'll have a jury trial, a trial by jury. So he, uh, what happened was, it basically ended, you know, uneventfully like that. He's like, well, you know, he says, I'm going to dismiss this claim. I said, huh, I got you. He said, you're going to dismiss this claim. I thought he said there wasn't a claim for you to this court. I thought he said it was a complaint. So you do recognize the word claim. Huh, I got you. And you said in front of all these people, you're going to dismiss my claim. Huh, you can't dismiss a man's claim. That's my claim. That's my drink of water. That's my hat. You can't take nothing away from a fellow man without fair and just conversation. You can't do nothing to what is mine. He said, it's my claim. Ha, I got you. And then it was funny. He was just like, oh, damn. And then I ran off about five, ten more minutes. And <laughs> just in the court, it was a lot of fun. And he just sat there and shut up. So it was a lot of fun. Can I ask you a question? Huh? There's, there's a couple things I've been wanting to ask you on for a long time. Two questions. Was it about this was case he, that I'm talking about? Kind of. Okay, well, let me finish up the case thing. When the judge said it was dismissed, okay, he did write an opinion. I'm surprised he did it without me saying, you know, can you give me the conclusions of the law and the statements of fact instead of uh, instead of me having to actually ask him. If, if when you put something in before a court and a court denies you, a court does anything, you just say to them, can you give me the conclusions in law and the statements of fact and which you're relying upon to give this opinion, your opinion today. That's if they give you any guff. Is a denied or dismissed or whatever, overruled, whatever. Say, well, I'm going to require you to give me the conclusions, law, and the statements of facts. Where are you getting this from? You, you're not just telling me this. You're not just telling me this just because you got nothing better to do, just because you don't like me, or you go to bed with the prosecutor. You're not, you know, I need to know the conclusions, law, and statements of facts, and what you're relying upon to tell me this. So when he dismissed it, 
it was, it was, it was nice because the way he wrote it was, um, I was like a dollar a second until the restoration of the property, to the return of the restoration of the property. He says, you didn't tell me what time it started. He said, tell me what time. Tell me what exact time we should start clocking the compensation. And tell me, that's what he needed, and he says, and put it in the form of an order. That's why he dismissed it. He says, I don't know it's the exact time when you want me to start clocking it in and you didn't create an order. So when you, when you put a claim before a court, you have to make sure that you tell the exact amount that you wish to get in compensation, and you have to put in form of an order. The judge doesn't create the order, you create the order. And the judge just bears witness that this order came before him this day. The other side didn't challenge the order. The order is a true, you know, let the order commence. You know, and then I go to the sheriff's department and they help me on the execution of the order. So when he dismissed it, he wrote a lovely opinion. So I was like, oh, huh, that's sweet. That's nice of him. If I wanted to file a complaint through him, you know what? I think that could work with this guy. If I wanted to file a complaint, if I wanted to operate under his rules, it would sound pretty reasonable. I'd say, hey, you know what? That sounds pretty reasonable. If I want to file a complaint instead of a claim. So, um, uh, the other one was the man asked me for it. Everybody knows this one now who listens to me, but some man didn't know the difference between dismiss and discharge. There's a man down in uh, Dallas, Texas. Believe it or not, his name is Mr. Ewing. His first, <laughs> his first name is Chris, though. Mr. Ewing. I went down there in 2014, back in, it was hot, so it must have been May. It was hot. I got a pair of boots out of it, of course, that was great. He still owes me money. <laughs> but, uh, he was in an IRS case. He's a publishing uh, distributor for magazines. And he decided not to deal with the IRS or wrongfully file or lie about his taxes for all those years. So the IRS came after him for 1999 to 2006. And in the criminal court down there, the judge actually asked, why aren't you pursuing for the, all those years? He says, I, you know, at this time, the United States just wants to pursue him for those years. And I said, oh, they're smart. Because if you beat him up this way, they're going to come at you with a different way for those. I said, they're smart. They're splitting up the case. They're splitting up the charges. Very smart. Because if you lose here, try to find another way to come after you that way. Very intelligent people. So uh, I wrote a notice for him. And he sent it off to the prosecutor and the judge. The United States government wanted to move it in 14 days. The judge said, we'll send it off for a year, this case, to trial. I said, fantastic. I said, we need to fuck, we need, see, only, the only reason, if he was Joe Sixpack and didn't have a freaking clue, I'd say, oh no, we want to move the trial today. Because I'm here, they're here, let's get it on, I'll say a couple of words before we'll be done. But since we got a year, and Mr. Ewing knows the IRS tax code just about better than anybody I've ever talked to in my life, because he was trying to keep from going to jail, losing his house, losing his publishing distribution company, he had a lot on the line, so he studied massively. So it was a lot of fun dealing with somebody who knew the code that well. So I said to him, you understand, you're no longer in tax court. Where tax court, they determine the rules. They can say up is down and down is up. They can say whatever they want. Right now, you're in a criminal court. They brought, in Texas, they made the IRS before they seize any property, freeze bank accounts, before they take anything away from a, a man in Texas, they don't look at the man in Texas as a U.S. citizen. They look at you're a Texan first, then you're a U.S. citizen before we let somebody who's not Texan come in here called the IRS, take something from our fellow Texan. They're going to have to prosecute him criminally. And this would be great if the IRS has to do this in every state of the union. It would be fantastic. Because once you're on a criminal side, there's something called Rule 15. Depositions. I said to Mr. Ewing, said, oh, this is fantastic. I said, did you call me up and you flew me down here? I said, because I always wanted the deposition of the United States of America. I always wanted to do that. I always wanted to get their representative, their attorney, whoever claims to be, you know, speaking for the United States of America. I'd love to knock them off their position, because that's what a deposition is. You want to knock them off their status of standing. You want to diminish their capacity. You want to put them where they belong. You believe they should be 
instead of standing over me, I want to knock them down to either be equal to me or lower than me. So right now they think they're above me. Oh, really? I want to deposition you. I want to move you out of your happy place. I want to put you over here equal with me. Now, as a matter of fact, I want to put you down here where you answer to me. How's that? No, no, don't deposition me. Don't deposition me. Okay, well, fine. You know, that's, like I said, how they play these word games instead of, you know, deposition or deposition. I'm going to position you in a different place. No, no, deposition. So it's a lot of fun how they mess with the words just a little bit. So uh, I said them we got this golden opportunity to send them interrogatories. We got this opportunity to put their representatives in a, a, you know, in a deposition in an arena where we just meet up at a law office or Chuck E. Cheese, wherever they want to meet at, an empty library room, and we're going to question them. And we're going to ask them some simple questions like, what's a tax? Well, who's a taxpayer? Well, what's a taxpayer? We're going to ask them some very basic, simple questions that billions of people all over the world always wanted to know. We're finally going to get the ability to do this. Because if they don't do it, and we're in criminal court, we could have the court order sanctions against the IRS until they answer. We could freeze them. We could also have them held in a contempt of court. We could hold them in contempt of court so they can't move again in any criminal courthouse in Texas until they answer these damn questions. I said, we got the golden opportunity to help a lot of people here. Well, that clown couldn't care less. You know, he was incredibly intelligent. He knew all the codes. If they tried to come after me or him with a code, he could have zapped him right back because he sounded better than the guy who wrote the code book. So it would have been a lot of fun if we could have depositioned IRS representatives, sent them interrogatories, have sanctions against them for failing to cooperate in discovery. It would have been a lot of fun just to say, can you tell me what the IRS is? What's the difference between the IRS, the International Revenue Service, what the Department of International Revenue Service is, what the Department of Treasury for the United States of America, you know, we could ask them all these questions. What's the difference between the Department of Treasury, the Treasury, uh, the United States Department of Treasury, the United States Department of, uh, the United States of America Department of Treasury, we could ask them all these different ways of how you people word yourselves, and which one do we actually owe the debt to? Do we owe it to the Department of Treasury? Do we owe it to the United States Department of Treasury? Do we owe it to the IRS? Do we owe it to the Internal Revenue Service? And we could have just listed a whole bunch of, which one exactly are we paying? Which one of these are we paying? And which one is under the public law, which we have a duty and obligation to perform? So it would have been fun. But the day before um, trial, the IRS dismissed the case against him. He was like, yay. I said, yay, what? He accomplished absolutely nothing, clown. Because it's not discharged. He should have put conditions on a dismiss. Because when you're in the Army, and they blow Reveille at 4 a.m., everybody better appear and count out. You know, count off who's here, who count off who's not here. So when the, the, the sergeant will, at, will say, company's dismissed, that means you go do whatever you want to do, but 4 o'clock tomorrow morning, you better reappear. You've been dismissed for 24 hours. When you're discharged from the Army, you turn in your uniform, you turn in your gun, you turn in every damn thing, and you go home, you have no more duty and obligation to the Army. You're done. You're discharged. Or you're honorably discharged, dishonorable, it doesn't matter. But you, you have no more duty and obligation. You, you know, as far as they're concerned, you're dead to them. So when he had his case dismissed, he should have said, no, you're going to put on your trial tomorrow, you're going to answer the damn question, and then once I find out, and the whole world finds out, that you moved a claim against me of a debt that wasn't true due or owed, I'm going to turn around tomorrow and I'm going to prosecute you. And then you're going to have to explain why you filed a claim against me, a complaint against me that wasn't true. That's going to be my turn to prosecute you. So he should have went for the discharge. How I know that's true is there's a man who called up my show from Ohio. I call him Popeye. You know, he's a powerful little guy and he's always wired and always wants to fight. So uh, he calls me up and one day and he says he goes into court and he says that uh, he wants his property back, which happens to be drugs. And that's why he's so wiry and tight and everything else. Yeah, Popeye. But it's his property, he wants it back, he wants it back, whether it's uh, in insulin or whatever. It's his, he can steal it, 
He traded for another man with fair and just compensation. Nobody claimed he robbed him. No, the government, no state can interfere with man's right to contract. It's actually right there in the, you know, in the Constitution. If you want to even believe in the Constitution, the, the states cannot interfere with man's right to contract to get into an agreement with his fellow man. It's ridiculous. You can't possibly have somebody sitting at a table trying to determine, you know, what I can and cannot agree with you. You, know, you certainly don't want a government guy sitting here. No, no, no. You don't. Don't say that to him. That's no. That's not proper call. Don't explain discharge like that. No, that's not what we call a discharge. I don't need the government tell me what to do, not to do. So like I said, um, uh, the man was asking for his property to be restored to him. So what happened was, his attorney said to him, now that you're starting trouble and you're actually coming after us with a claim, the government, through, and the man was like 45 years old and he's been getting in trouble with drugs since he's 20, all those old cases that were dismissed against you, they're all coming after you again. They're going to bring back to life the other 37 cases they had against you, and now you now got to deal with this drug case, you got to deal with the other 37 that were dismissed. So now we're going to bombard you with 37 cases. Now you're going to defend yourself from all of those cases. And he knows my stuff really well, so it's all lovely. Because I just need a man to come forward to swear on the other affirmation that I've done something wrong. And then we got a case. Until then, without the damage, or well, say, the, the adage is, no action may arise without damages, or no action may arise to man without damages. There must be damages. No action. There can be no rise to an action without damages. It's can, that simple. Can he do that without filing a claim of his own? What's that? Tell them I just require a man to come forward. No, everything got to be in writing. I'm saying he could say that without filing a claim of his own. Oh, of course. Okay. Oh yeah, like I did with Mr. Ewing, I did something like that with Mr. Ewing. Did okay. Rest. Something like that. But like I said, if you write, okay, people think that it's very simple what I do, and I I think it's very simple what I do. Whenever I talk to anybody and they talk to me on internet or radio or anything, we talk. They say to me, see, I can see him sovereign, see, to fight gravity. So, well, that's pretty cool. That paper towel show, not full. <laughs> well, I guess you can make a damn yeah, rule that just there conquered gravity. There you go. But what I'm saying is, uh, sovereign is God. Yeah. So, what I'm saying with the, with the damages rule is almost every single person in jail is in jail or incarcerated in prison or detention centers and there's no damages. Nobody's ever come forth and claimed that there was a damaged party and dead. That it was dead. Dead in German means guilt. That's all it means. And all this English law we have is because the Saxons and the Normans and the Normans won and they're German. All our English law is based on German beliefs. God, I'm German because it's really easy for me to understand these simple concepts. That means guilt. Okay, it was funny. <laughs> CNN, when uh, Greece was going into austerity, and Germany was the creditor, and they were the debtors. CNN went over there to Greece. They said to the Greek kids, 18-year-olds who just happened to walk through the mall, walking out of, into the park, said, if you got a million dollars, what would you do? As a Greek 18-year-old youth, how, what would you do? I'd buy fancy shoes, a yacht, uh, gold earrings, uh, you, know, uh, you know, a nice home, da 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 CNN went over to Germany, stopped 18-year-olds in the street, said, well, if you got a million dollars, what would you do? Well, the first thing I'd do is I'd consult my mother and my father. And I'd ask them where a proper investment opportunities would be for me. Or I'd give it to my family and they invested in my family's company. Every single freaking 18 year old they stopped in Germany came with that same damn answer. I'd go ask my mom and dad what I should do with it. Every Greek kid said, I'll buy jewelry and fancy yacht and a speedboat and a Maserati. Every single Greek kid was hysterical. And every German kid said, I'll go ask mom and dad. I'll go talk to my family. 
You see what I'm saying? So we understand the concept of unity, we understand the concept of citizenship, and we understand what family means. So when they try to muscle me, I just laugh. I go, what, you think you give me a million dollars, I'm going to go buy some PZO tennis shoes, buy a gold plate? No, 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 no. I'm going to see what I can do for my family. So I don't know who you think you are talking to me like that, because you don't look like my daddy. Because that's the only person I'm going to talk to about anything. Are you saying wish a lot? Can you just explain wish? Okay, but like I said, too, debt means guilt. Germans hate being in debt because that means they owe duty and obligation. And when you're in debt, you're actually somebody else's slave. And they tell you to jump, you jump. So nobody wants to be a slave, so I don't want to get debt. I've never applied for a credit card in my life. It's funny. Uh, that's why when it's funny when I give my social security number out, 12662428, give my date of birth, my mom's maiden name. I said, oh, you people think... Uh, now you're going to run and go apply for credit cards for me? Yeah, well, when somebody charges something, I said, I have a history of never applying for a credit card in 50-something years on planet Earth. And I'm going to say, uh, I never applied for that. Where's the signature on that? I said, now you people know what my signature looks like, so when you sign up for a credit card, it's not going to match, I guarantee it. So, there's no doubt about it. I didn't apply for no credit card because I don't believe in ever being in debt. You know, because that's what I say to people. Most people don't understand. When you say mortgage, that's a death pledge. That means it's the death. So I hear people uh, on my show all the time saying, uh, I got a mortgage and I can't pay it. Well, and the, and the banks are so unreasonable about it. Hmm, let me see. The way mortgages used to work was if Carl Lentz and, and uh, Bob, I decided to give Bob a mortgage. If I said for myself, you know what? Bob was three pennies late on paying his cell phone bill of $12 last month, I believe Bob's a bad risk. I'm going to go back and I want to ask for Bob from all my money right now. And he's got about three seconds to hand it over to me, or I'm going to take away from him whatever we mortgaged. His house, his car, his children, whatever the hell he mortgaged, whatever he gave over to me. You got about three seconds before you got to give it over. And he's got, and I got a whole bunch of people behind me that are going to throw you out of that house. So I said, you're very lucky that the, the mortgage rules in this country are very liberal and very relaxed because it was meant instant death. It was a death pledge he gave. That the moment that the person wanted their money back, you had to return it immediately. It was funny when you, uh, why people do that, to me, I believe, is when you take out loans and you take out mortgages and you do credit card, it's, it's a godless society. And the reason why this is, is because not so much godless like there's a guy floating around in a cloud, is because they believe man creates their own law, their own rules. You think you just make it up as you go along. It's pretty funny. If you ever watched, um, I watched this years ago when I was a kid, Little House on the Prairie. And it was so funny watching the dad try to convince the mom to take out a loan because for whatever reason they planted something in the fields, a rain came, washed all the seeds away. So mom and dad were having to go to the bank to ask for money for new seeds. And the mom was like, 